All right, so uh, I'm Chisa, and I am the Research and Development Technical Program Manager based in London for Pivotal. And today we are running a panel. So I'm actually going to let the panel introduce themselves, and I'm also going to let them describe exactly what we're talking about. So I'll start with introductions, and then we'll go through and discuss what the goals of effectively what we're talking about are. Howdy. OK, so uh, my name is Deborah Wood. I am the product manager for the team that runs uh, platforms in uh, Pivotal. Uh, one of the platforms that we run is for Pivotal Tracker in production. And the conversation today is around the platform that we ran for uh, the sport relief campaign. Uh, we ran the platform, Amakuni wrote the software to collect donations, and we're just going to talk about um, some of the things that we did to mitigate fear, given that we were distributed teams across various countries, and uh, the comic relief thing is, is a pretty high pressure, night of TV donations, collect millions for charity, you don't want things to go up, kaboom. So um, we just had a couple of uh, pragmatic things that we did that we think might be helpful for yourselves. So Deborah, hello. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Zenon. I'm, I work for Amakuni. We're a cloud-native uh, software consultancy. Uh, I've been involved with this particular project for much longer than that. For about the last eight years, I've been doing the donations platform for Comic Relief. It's been quite a, quite a joyful journey. And yeah, I'm the COO at Amakuni, but that generally means we're quite a small company. That means I just do all the crap. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's me. Uh, my name is James Wynn. I'm a staff engineer for Pivotal Cloud Ops in Dublin. This was the second year we did uh, the Comic Relief platform out of the Dublin office. Uh, and I had to do a few different things this time. Great. So um, to start, uh, and we've already um, talked about the fact that we are effectively going to look at incident handling. I'd, I'd like to start with Xenon and just tell us a little bit about the problem that you saw and the opportunity. And can you just tell us what happened? OK. So. Um, for those who don't know Comic Relief, we're a UK charity, and once a year they have a TV show that runs for about seven hours, and they collect a lot of the money during that TV show. So we, about eight, seven, eight, seven years ago, we had to rebuild the platform. It was an old platform, an old Java platform that had 12 different organizations that came together to help deliver it, about 35, 40 people. Tin would arrive on the 1st of January, you'd kind of get everyone together, you know, some of the big players, you know, Oracle, Cisco, some of the other kind of uh, IBM, etc. They'd all come together and patch the old platform together and just like hope for hell that it would still work. And it kind of, uh, in 2011, it kind of reached the peaks where we, it almost broke because of the level of traffic. So we realized we needed to rewrite it. And so Armakuni uh, pitched to rewrite it and tried uh, a few of the kind of platform as a service uh, uh, providers out there and settled on Cloud Foundry. So for the first few years, we ran it on open source Cloud Foundry across a private vSphere environment, across AWS. And then a couple of years ago, we partnered with Pivotal and we uh, ran it uh, across PCF. And so uh, that worked really well. And whereas before it was a single team that was uh, doing all of the development and supporting the platforms as well, the proper kind of, uh, in a proper kind of uh, single, single DevOps team, um, it then changed when Pivotal came in because Pivotal were running the platform and the team were running the development. So we had to change some of the practices and the things that we did. And uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, so Deborah, can you be can you expand upon that and kind of be a little bit more explicit around the role that Pivotal played in this particular incident? Yeah. Alrighty. So um, Pivotal was providing the PCF uh, foundation. Uh, in this particular year, so this year, we changed it up a bit. So we had a multi-foundation set up. We had three PCF installations. One was serving as a canary environment that we could just push uh, product updates to. And then we had two PCF installations that served as two different regions for the actual uh, production receiving of um, donations. What we did a little differently this year was we wanted to experiment with allowing internal product teams to liaise directly with application developers to uh, just understand the use cases of how they were running the software that we write. Uh, so this year we had uh, PKS, which was our pivotal container service. We were getting ready to go GA on that. Uh, they were interested in participating just to learn from app dev users, um, just to get first-hand empathy of um, how, how it is to run software on PKS. We also had HealthWatch, which is the tool that we have to observe uh, platform 
um, behavior uh, over, so that team was also participating actively, so they were personally pushing their software to, um, to the environment. We also had Redis. So we, what we were doing just from a product side of Pivotal is we, we saw this as an opportunity to have internal Pivotal teams working directly with Armour Cooney, um, app dev teams, uh, to experience the, the highs and lows and, and interesting moments of getting ready for a, a very high profile, um, high sensitivity TV telethon. I mean, I don't think it gets much better to, to learn how to do things right. So that's what we were doing differently this year but with the same objective. And then, James, can you start us off, but then anyone can also add in, in terms of how exactly that played out step by step? Ooh, um, I'm not sure how it's played out step by step, but uh, just one of the things as well that was big, very different for us this year was, um, Debbie mentioned PKS, but we also had uh, MongoDB as well, and we were running this on PKS. So this would have been the first, it's probably the first production load ever on PKS to be run. So people are quite anxious, to say the least, about this. So what we did was we decided to put together a process to try to alleviate people's fear. So we started off with kind of simple, simple drills of just people receiving a page. Didn't have to do anything, but just, hey, I now know what a page looks like. I now get some sense of the feeling of getting the call at the middle of the night. And then we kind of increased the complexity each time, testing out things like access, make sure people had the right permissions and so on. The whole way up until we built uh, an exercise whereby someone had to go in and actually try to debug a fake Mongo uh, issue. And through this, we were able to build up an awful lot of confidence because a lot of people didn't actually want, nobody wanted to support the Mongo instance. Yeah. And this was a big problem for us. <laughs> I'd add to that, like that was probably the um, that was the interesting part of this exercise is that in the previous years we had we were running Mongo uh, on a particular tile and we'd had to tweak that tile a wee bit, uh, but that was how it had been done last year, and there were clear understandings of who owns what, who who handles incidents in this particular component. This year. Because we wanted to use the opportunity to run on PKS, it was more complicated for the Armour Cooney team because while they were the uh, experts in MongoDB and troubleshooting that, they were not and could not be expected to be experts on PKS. Mm -hmm. So they were like, grand, I know how to troubleshoot a MongoDB issue. I don't know how to necessarily get there and I certainly don't know how to get there under pressure at two o'clock in the morning if something goes bananas. And so I can't reasonably be expected to hold operational responsibility for this. Uh, in the past, yes, but now I can't. And like we were in a bit of a stalemate because we couldn't use the tile of last year because it had uh, gone out of support. Um, we could use the latest and greatest uh, and patched update of MongoDB if we ran it on PKS, but now the knowledge required to troubleshoot an incident was spread across three teams. So we had the platform team, which is my team. We had the PKS team. So my team aren't experts in PKS. The PKS team is experts in PKS. And then the Armour Cooney team was experts in MongoDB. So there was this, it took us almost six weeks to just, with, with Night of TV coming up very quickly for us to decide, worst case scenario, something happens on MongoDB. It is a bit more complicated this year, and everyone's very afraid of this hot potato. No one can be expected to to have all of the knowledge should something go down. So that was interesting. It becomes an interesting challenge because it's that kind of separation of duty. So the last few years that we've run it with Pivotal, the operating, uh, the platform team haven't really known anything about the about the app. You know, it's 26 different microservices, it's eventually consistent, uh, things go into queues and Redis, uh, MongoDB could actually go away and it's, it wouldn't be a problem. We take the money, it'd be harder to report on how much money we had, but we take the money and that's the kind of primary goal of the platform. So, but then when you move into a, into a situation that we had now where there was kind of like a lack of clarity of, of not so much who is responsible, for, just who is responsible for what, but actually what the process is if something goes on. How do you get the information? How do you get to the place you need to get to to find out what's going on and where that responsibility lies? It led to some really interesting kind of challenges. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to probably call out something you said earlier on the stage uh, this morning, Chisa, when you were talking about that communication. Yeah. 
and about the kind of teams working together. And I think a really big uh, plus point that came out of all the exercises we were running was about that developing a trust and developing that kind of feeling that even though we were in a way, three separate teams with three separate responsibilities. We're all working together to achieve that goal. Yeah. And we kind of, kind of, once you build that kind of trust and psychological safety between the teams and you build that kind of confidence in each other's abilities, that was a really important thing. Because under pressure, if you don't have those things, it can quickly, quickly go wrong. So uh, one, one of the challenges that you have all mentioned is that there was just this fear of responsibility amongst yep. the humans. <laughs> Um, and kind of like a lack of confidence. I'm wondering, are there any other challenges that stood out to you in, in this experience? This kind of goes back to the fear thing again a little bit, but one of the other things is our Makuni know their platform and have been doing this for many years, as uh, Zeno just mentioned. Our team is an operations team. The PKS team was a brand new R&D development team, and their concept of kind of support, they didn't necessarily have a concept of support. They didn't have a concept of having to dial in somewhere and so on. So it was really important to get their confidence up on doing this. Because even though they were the experts, they, weren't, they were not necessarily the experts while they were in the trenches. And that was, that was important to try to build up that confidence with them. And then earlier we were, we were talking, and one thing that you mentioned was um, having access to the right things. Yeah. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Um, interestingly, uh, our director, so David Lang, has a rich history in operations, and his um, his kind of gem of understanding is that usually in incident management, uh, the biggest issue is getting access to the right thing. Once you've done that, um, then you're in your comfortable place. You understand the technology, and you can get going. So for us, the the setup was quite intriguing. So we had the VPN to protect access to the two production regions. So you need, your, you need the oh, software I'll and talk. the credentials to Opt log into the VPN. Yeah. Then you need to know which, re which uh, region are you talking about. So are we talking about uh, region A or region B of production? Then what are the credentials to get into PKS? What are the credentials to get to MongoDB? Okay, now which one of the MongoDBs? So it's not so much looking at the software that's failing, it's just getting to it. Yeah. Um, and you don't really want to be learning that under pressure when everybody's looking at your software on TV and BBC and it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you don't know who to ping for a password. Yeah. So probably the thing that built the most confidence in the various teams. So generally what we did is we, we had a fire drill and it was a toy example. And we said, OK, Armakuni, you, you send us an email to this specific reserved email address. It's going to page us, operations team, we are going to do a mock triage. Okay, this looks like it's a Redis instance or issue, or this looks like it's a blah issue. We're going to go call the people who are the subject matter experts of that, bring them into this Zoom call, and we're going to chat. But ultimately, we're going to practice. So I'm going to say, Mr. PKS person, can you get me the last log entry on cluster X on region Y? And I take my hands off. I'm not going to help you. The point of the exercise is, do you know how to get there? And if not, let's, let's make sure that the software is installed on your machine that you're going to be using that night. So basically, I want to make it routine. So by the time, if anything does happen, you've done this so many times that you know exactly who, what to get. You have the password, pa passwords. And some of the things that were surfaced in these fire drills is that it was, a, it was as silly as having the wrong version of a CLI yep. that, that could have blocked you or not realizing that you didn't have the VPN set up on your personal machine at home that could have blocked you. That's not really that difficult to fix, but if, if under pressure that, that adds a lot of stress, that can be avoided. So the fire drills were basically just housekeeping. Can you get there? And the other thing is just to, with the fire drills is there was a kind of a general prog a progression. So you kind of start off with your own workstation that you use every day, and so you think, oh, this is kind of pointless because I do this every day. But then how about doing it from your laptop? Oh, hang on, I actually don't have the right version of Tunnel Blake. Okay, how about doing it from your laptop on wireless in Starbucks? Oh, hang on, we need a firewall rule now, and so on. And it's, this progression meant we kind of were able to head off these niggly little problems that, as we keep stressing, you don't want to find out when the world's on fire. Um, so, I think for me, it was, uh, what was really enlightening was the... So we're great believers in the concept of observability within our software, being able to know what's going on from the outside just simply by looking at the outputs that it's producing. So I think um, 
was really interesting for us was being able to go through a process. And so we run fire drills, kind of game days quite a lot. And then we have days where the role of one person is to go around through the platform, you know, doing a bit of chaos engineering, taking things out of the loop, knocking out a Redis, seeing what happens, and getting the understanding under a kind of not real pressure, but kind of uh, fake kind of pressure of, OK, when we spot this thing in the app, when we spot that we're getting loads of kind of uh, 403s from one of the payment service providers, it's showing this and it's appearing like this for the platform team. And this is what it means. And kind of going through those scenarios so that you get kind of a shared understanding of what a problem looks like, what a possible problem will look like for us as an app development team, for the platform team and for the PKS team. And kind of really practicing that and then practicing the loop between us all yep. of how we then communicate that things you know, rather than you know, sending suddenly sending the platform team like a snippet of a log that might mean nothing to them at all, yep. rather than like, yep. well, what information is of use to you to help you identify what the issue is? And so, really, it's about that kind of. I don't like to use a sort of term that comes to mind is that kind of sort of human glue of kind of <laughs> gluing everything together. Not that I want to melt people down and produce <laughs> glue, but you know. So, and I think you call that the, one of the third challenges that you mentioned earlier, which is effectively getting rid of the silos um, between people. So, um, it sounds like the three things were um, just making sure that there weren't silos, making sure that people actually are ready to mm -hmm. walk out the door when we say we're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the third one was just making sure that we're mitigating for the fear yep. that people have. Um, so then, out of that, what do you think ultimately were the biggest learnings that you took from this? I think for me, just for no no one team can be expected to be the expert and confidently able to troubleshoot these very diverse areas of software. So my team were because of the amount of work that we or amount of time we spend on PCF, we are experts in troubleshooting PCF. We know that um, PKS, having built that entire tool set, are experts in where to start looking and what symptoms are there. Blah, blah, blah. Amakuni know exactly what MongoDB is being used for, what, what queries they're running, all that jazz. No one team could be credibly expected to hold that hot potato. So we had to collaborate and make, and make it explicit and practice that the three teams together are, gonna, are, are going to be available. Experts from all three will be available on call. And we were, we are, we were actually in the room uh, with Amakuni. Uh, in London, but everybody is available and we are two seconds away. We're yeah. all actually um, going to be holding. And just the fact that everybody knew that someone who is an expert in that particular area can get me to where I need to be under pressure. So if I'm like, there's a, there's a PKS thing somewhere and on that is a MongoDB and I've got to get there, help, then there's a MongoDB person in the room, there's a platform person in the room, and there's, so, just the fact that it was shared was that was a, that was a, a massive thing. Shared and practiced. Yeah, I think um, I think I'd call out in particular. There's 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 something that kind of sounds like it's against the kind of whole principle of DevOps and kind of shared ownership. But is that idea that within that, having that culture of shared ownership and collaboration and working mm -hmm. together to achieve that goal, but having a really clear, explicit separation of duty so that everyone is really sure about what their little spaces and not in that kind of their little space like I'm going to stick my elbows out and protect that little space and not going to let anyone know what's going on inside of that space but more of that I know what I have to do I know what I'm responsible for and when something moves outside of that space I know who I need to talk to and yeah. specifically how they want to be talked to under pressure in this moment what information they need from me in order for them to be able to do their their part of the kind of magic circle if you want to call it that and then just practice 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 you can't beat you can't kind of beat it um, I think for me, like and Z as Zinon mentioned, this was the building of trust. Uh, like the teams only work together once a year for a few months and various changes. But for us going through this process, we all learned about each other and we built up that trust. So we weren't kind of going, oh, I hope the Army Cooney guys really have their stuff together tonight. But uh, we worked with them, we got that trust. But the other thing is uh, it also, individuals learn to trust themselves, that this wasn't an overwhelming thing. I, I've done this 20 times and there are lots of different circumstances, so I can trust that I will be able to competently do my job if something bad happens under this high pressure. And that to me is a really positive outcome. I think it's amazing that um, 
you know, you, you, we, we know that we want to have confidence in our technical solutions, but we mm. oftentimes don't reflect on the fact that we need to have confidence in our human solutions, yep. and you need both to have a fully comprehensive solution. So yep. that's a really interesting point to make. And I think that's uh, part of the XP manifesto is it's the person over the process as well yeah. and focusing on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I do want to make sure that we have time for questions and we have a few minutes left. Are there any questions in the audience for the panel? <laughs> no. Anyone else? <laughs> so, what, what, what actually happened on the night? Did anything go wrong? Did you have to use any of these processes that you put in place? Uh, <laughs> it, was quite, it, was, it was really boring. <laughs> yeah. It's what we like. We like boring. So the first year that I ever did this was with the old platform, and it was singly the most exciting thing <laughs> of my life from a work perspective. Mm -hmm. But it's not a light I'd ever want to relive again. Lots of things went wrong, lots of things which weren't tried, lots of things under pressure which we had to kind of resolve then and there with a new solution, which is something, a place I'd never want to be again. So I learned my lesson that night. And so with, with a new platform, it's become increasingly more boring. Yeah. So the context of, of this is with a short event of very high importance. I'm curious as to how that influences the team for the non like dealing with millions of pounds in a short <laughs> in a few hours and the more like continuous nature because it sounded like there was also a lot of build up in prep mm -hmm. that sort of matched the uh, urgent or not urgency but like the the care and important yeah. relevance of of this short event. Yeah, so within the, our cloud ops team, we do the same sort of thing nearly the whole time, especially when we're onboarding new people. We start them off with getting a page to do something really silly or trivial, like target a particular Bosch deployment. And we run these until people get pretty confident, and then we give them a, a problem which is unknown to them. And they use up these things that they, like you always talk about muscle memory. They've developed so much muscle memory that when they see this unknown, they're automatically almost uh, setting up the VPN, targeting the Bosch deployment, checking the VM health check, and then they, they suddenly realize, oh, hang on, I've almost got this problem solved, and I, didn't, I still don't know what it is. And that, that's pretty important. Yeah, and like further to that, we do use it for training. So in Dublin and Pivotal at the moment, uh, some of the products that we run or are developing, be that uh, CFCR, which is open source, uh, Kubernetes running on Bosch and PKS, members of those teams have been kind of, there's an understanding that they will at some point need to be going onto the pager. They will have to be that expert team in this uh, for, for our customers. And these are engineers that have never really been in any kind of operational um, activity, and it's very frightening for them, yep. and, and legitimately so. So we use what we used with Armakuni uh, to train those teams to not be scared of the pager. Just practice. It's not... It, uh, the fear of the unknown is probably the biggest thing here. So if I can just get you past that, then you'll feel more comfortable. And I think in a microservices DevOps world, that's probably going to become more routine. Yeah, and I think um, for me it's... I'm sure Debbie and James would want to be sat in a room with me looking at the grass like they <laughs> for that night every day. And sort of, uh, I don't think anyone can possibly have a team who could just sit there looking at graphs and tailing logs to see when the errors are coming up. Yep. But you can automate that aspect of it. And, uh, and the more that you practice your response as a team to getting that pager, to getting that email or something about an outage, about an issue, the better, more slick your team are going to become. And again, that kind of your confidence will increase. Yep. And then I think once, once you start getting that sort of stuff as a routine in the team, I think then you can start pushing out as an operations team and saying, what else can I do to ensure the reliability and resilience of the platforms that are under my control? You know, do I, can I start moving into a bit of chaos engineering? Can I start actively looking to bring my system down? Mm -hmm. And then you start, I think, going to really, really good pace and really thinking about that kind of resilience engineering. Like one thing, just to that point, uh, we, we are, in our team, we, we prioritize uh, making changes to the production platform during office hours, so that everybody's awake, caffeinated, and at their best. <laughs> and the beauty of it is that when you are in your comfort zone, you have the support of the people around you, figuring out an incident like that is actually quite thrilling. It's actually quite yeah, like, 
I have no idea what's going on. It's like this Inspector Gadget kind of moment. But, and it's, it's fun. It, there is actually an adrenaline bump in a, when, when you sort this out. So if, if you can do it during office hours, it's actually quite interesting. Mm. So fire drills like that are, take the, the boring tailing logs thing to this is actually a pretty, pretty cool exercise to play with. We have a sign up in our office. I think it's something along the lines of "Don't panic when the well, don't panic when the failure happens because you won't enjoy it," and that's something that we we try to push. How did you plan capacity, and what was Plan B if there is too much traffic or data? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so we built the platform so that individual what we call a shard so in each instance each foundation with the platform running on it could take 500 donations a second so we've got two of those so we theoretically could take a thousand now i read a figure that at any point the kind of peak of actual all credit card transactions across the whole of uk is about 450 a second so we would if that happened our, our finance director would have been over the moon <laughs> thrilled but essentially what i think the, the platform's designed to cope with failure at every level so you know you can lose front ends, it's quite entirely stateless, it's eventually consistent, so you can lose the whole MongoDB and the, you, you, it makes reporting a little bit more difficult because you have to pull the numbers straight out of Redis, but you can do that. You can lo lose an individual Redis, you can lose multiple Redis, you can lose a whole, you can lose a whole um, foundation and the other foundation will still, will still work and cope. So you're kind of designing for failure. Uh, but ultimately, if everything failed and it all went down, there's also a backup system that another, uh, another kind of tech partner provides just in case. So. But we did do a lot of load testing and yeah. stuff like that beforehand as well. And yeah, we did a hell of a lot of load testing. We've got an auto in, our, in our pipeline, there's an automated overnight performance test, not the full thing, and that runs overnight and kind of lets you, lets you know if, if there's been any degradation of service. And then we run regular, like uh, in the run-up, probably three or four times a week, we're running load tests against... Uh, So we are at time, but before we leave, I do just want, uh, in ter the last question I have is just, what's the one thing that you want people to leave with? So Twitter worthy, so keep it short. Okay, keep it short. Yeah, um, but what's the one thing that each of you would want the audience to leave with today? Um, failure will happen, practice. It's epic. It's like 180 characters, I'm sure. Pract okay. practice, practice builds trust. Yeah. Practice builds trust. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, Twitter, know. Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> um, okay, uh, Twitter takes more than 180 characters. <laughs> <laughs> Identify your fears. Like, what, what is it? Identify your fears and then... Overcome them with practice. So just don't, don't, don't dread this thing. Okay, I'm over 180. But don't dread it. Identify it, acknowledge it, and be, con be conscious of the people in, on, the, on the other side of the request yep. that you're making. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, panel. I shouldn't have been clapping myself. <laughs>